Hello and thank you for watching part 2 of the world in 2018. We have just passed a number of very important days that were associated with great signs in the heavens and also in events that recently took place in the world. On January 31st we had Tuba Shavat which is known as the New Year for Trees. It is very important to note that the almond tree is associated with this date given that it is considered to be the first tree to awaken to the spring season and that it is also associated with God watching over his word to perform it and thirdly to us who should be watching for the return of the Lord. This day was also marked with a very rare super blue blood moon which hasn't occurred in at least 150 years. Not only does the Hebrew word for almond also spell the word watch but the menorah which represents the church is also associated with the almond tree as can be seen in Exodus 25. Even Solomon would seem to be associating the rapture with the almond tree blooming in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 which we will look at in a bit. Here is a little more information from the website Hebrew for Christians that I would like to show you and you are welcome to pause the video at this point to read through the information yourself. If you have followed my posts on Facebook, you will know that the book of Zechariah would seem to describe much of what is happening in the Middle East today, and associating it with the time that we find ourselves in. If you have not seen these, please subscribe to the Signs and Seasons group, linked in the description below, where I do my best to post updates more frequently than I am able to put out in video format. In today's video I would like to do a quick update of what would seem to be happening in the world and how this could possibly relate to biblical prophecy. It would seem that we are at the point where the final pieces of the puzzle are quickly coming into view and where events transpiring in the world are beginning to point to prophecies that are associated with the start of Jacob's trouble and the rapture of the church. One such instance is found in Zechariah 1. In this passage, Zechariah is shown a vision of a man riding a red horse and being among the trees, which interestingly enough is mentioned three times in this chapter. If you have watched my other videos, you will know by now that I believe that we have to consider all of God's word in order to obtain a better understanding of what is written according to Isaiah 28 verse 9 and 10. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. If we read Zechariah in isolation from the rest of the word of God, we will not get the full picture. If, however, we search the Word of God for instances in which a red horse is mentioned, we find only the passage in Zechariah 1 and another in Revelation 6. We also know that the red horse mentioned in the book of Revelation is associated with the second seal being opened, and that peace will be taken from the earth at the time when this seal is opened. Going back to Zechariah, we also have a date on which this vision was given to the prophet, which directly precedes the description of the man riding the red horse. The Word of God also explains to us that everything that was written was written with a purpose, and the purpose is to teach us something. As such, it is important to note that Zechariah was inspired to record the date on which he received the vision of the man riding on the red horse. This occurred on the 24th day of the month of Shavat, nine days after Tuba Shavat or the New Year of Trees. There is a discrepancy between Hebkel and Torah calendar regarding this date, in which Hebkel consider this day to start on February 9th, while TorahCalendar.com considers the day to start on February 10th. Now on Tuba Shavat we had the super blue blood moon, which was followed two days later with the greatest one day decline in the Dow Jones, with the Dow Jones losing nearly 1600 points in one day. On the day after the blood moon we saw tension flaring up between Israel and Lebanon over oil that exists on the border between these two countries. Zechariah 11 points to conflict and judgment over Lebanon 
just before or at the time when the Antichrist is revealed. On February 7th, Hezbollah also threatened to attack Israel's offshore gas operations. What is however something that I believe we should keep a very close eye on, given that the 24th of Shavat is only days away at the time when this was written, is the tension between Israel and Syria, especially with what is going on in Damascus, which would seem to be one of the final pieces of the puzzle required to have Isaiah 17 fulfilled. This chapter also mentions a main harvest occurring at the time when Damascus is destroyed and the gleanings remain after this point. For me, this is the one event that we should watch for in order to know when our departure from this world can be expected. On January 28th, after Israel carried out attacks in Syria, Assad threatened Israel via a message from Putin, in which he said that if Israel attacked Syria again, that Syria would retaliate, as can be seen in the article which I've also linked in the description below. On January 29th, Netanyahu met with Putin to discuss the situation on Iran, Syria and Lebanon. And Netanyahu explained after the meeting that there are two conditions which Israel would not accept. The first is Iran establishing a foothold in Syria and the second is the manufacturing and transfer of Iranian weapons to Lebanon. On February 5th, a Russian jet was shot down and the pilot killed himself rather than to be captured by those on the ground in Syria. His body was then returned to Russia with the help of Turkey, who apparently stole the body from those in Syria, and smuggled it back into Turkey and then delivered it to Russia. On February 6, Prime Minister Netanyahu toured the Golan Heights overlooking the Syrian border and warned Israel's enemy not to test Israel's resolve. On February 7th, Israel once again attacked a military research facility in Syria and according to Syrian reports, most of these attacks had been blocked by their defense systems, but ammunition depots were hit. Syria also responded with the following comments. The general command of the armed forces holds Israel fully responsible for the dangerous consequences for its repeated aggressive and uncalculated adventures. These events are all pointing to several prophecies in the Word of God, which I believe line up with events that are associated with the rapture and occurring in the world today. Now I am fallible and what I see and share with you could be wrong, but it could also be right. We have so much more in the sense of fulfillment of prophecies and confirming signs when compared to what we had last year with the Revelation 12 sign alone. Last year on September 23rd when the Revelation 12 sign was fulfilled, the situation in the world in my opinion was not yet conducive to fulfilling the several prophecies that are clearly associated with the rapture and the start of Jacob's trouble. The fact that we have the red horse mentioned in Zechariah 1 and associated with the 24th day of the month of Shavat is in my opinion very significant in the light of all the preceding signs that we've received over the past few months. Our Heavenly Father has given us many signs to point us to the time that the world is about to enter and from which some will escape. Let us look at some of the events that I've mentioned and how these tie into prophecies that relate to the rapture of the church. In Joel and Luke we read the following two passages. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. What I find very significant about these passages is the fact that we've had two very significant eclipses, recently occurring back to back in the order mentioned in these two passages. The first was the solar eclipse that occurred on the 21st of August in 2017, 
which crossed over the United States having very precise details associated with it in both the day counts between this event and other significant events and the way in which this eclipse was positioned over the USA. This eclipse was also followed by several hurricanes namely Harvey, Irma, Maria and Jose of which Harvey was the most costly in history. The next eclipse was the super blue blood moon that occurred on Tuba Shavat or the 31st of January which marked a very special day associated with the almond tree and with God telling us that he watches over his word to perform it and for the wise to be watching and being awake with their lamps full of oil watching for his return. All of these signs point us to a period of time in which the Lord could come for us at any moment as these signs described in these passages would all seem to be fulfilled now. However, our Heavenly Father provides us with even more information from His Word in order to obtain more insight so that we can be ready and expecting Him when He returns for us. Let us look at the red horse next. In Zechariah 1, this vision of the red horse is specifically mentioned to have been given to Zechariah on the 24th day of Shavat. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sebat, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah the son of Berechiah the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses speckled and white. As I mentioned earlier, the book of Revelation gives us a little more information about the red horse, and in Revelation's case, the red horse is associated with one of the seals being opened. We also know that the first five seals would all seem to span the first three and a half years of the period known as the tribulation, and that the first three and a half years are specifically known as Jacob's trouble, and you're welcome to watch some of my previous videos in which I discuss this. The sixth seal focuses, in my opinion, on the time shortly before and also after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the crust of the earth will be split open as Jesus' feet touch down on the Mount of Olives. The first seal represents the Antichrist being revealed to the world, and which also represents, in my opinion, the start of God's judgment over the world. This is explained to us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in which we are told that our Heavenly Father sends the world a strong delusion that coincides with the man of sin being revealed to the world and that this will result in a delusion that may even deceive the elect if it were possible. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The same chapter also tells us that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer has been removed, and the Word of God clearly shows us that the only entity that currently has authority over Satan and his kingdom on earth is the Church, according to Matthew 16, verse 18 to 19, as well as Ephesians 6. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What is further interesting about this chapter in Zechariah is that the prophet is shown four horns, that were responsible for the division or scattering of Jerusalem and Judah. Today we know that these represent the Middle East Quartet, consisting of the USA, the UN, the EU and Russia. 
These four have been instrumental in keeping Israel and Jerusalem divided since Israel's return to their land, just as we see written. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Zechariah then sees what the King James Version translates as four carpenters, who unravels the four horns and their ability to scatter or divide Israel and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. What I find very interesting in this passage is the word carpenters that is used. The Hebrew word according to Strong's Concordance can also be translated as follows. Note how the word carpenter could be replaced with craftsman or mason without changing the meaning and for which I believe we would have a more accurate description of those who will be responsible for the unraveling of the Middle East Quartet. The root word also comes from a word that is spelled the same and gives even more insight into who the carpenters could be. In this explanation, it is even more amazing to see that the meaning behind the root word which is spelled exactly the same as the carpenters could have a figurative interpretation meaning to devise in a bad sense with the intent of keeping secrets or to conceal or to practice secretly. These are all attributes of the Freemasons today which are following the plan laid out in 1871 by Albert Pike in order to bring about the Third World War. According to Pike's letter, the start of this war will be brought about as a result of the differences caused between the political Zionists and the Muslims in order to have them destroy each other. I think we are already able to identify some of these Freemasons by the actions that have been taken by them in recent months in order to bring this desired outcome about and to fulfill Zechariah 1 verse 20. With the tension also rising between Israel and Lebanon, I was searching for some clues to this in the Word of God, and in chapter 11 of Zechariah, we find much more detail that associates Lebanon's destruction with events that will usher in Jacob's trouble and lead to our departure. In an article by Haaretz, this tension is called a war of no choice for Israel and Lebanon, which sounds quite serious and prophetic, and it definitely has a prophetic nuance to it. This is the introduction into Zechariah 11. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Howl, fir tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. The first two verses in chapter 11 start off with a command to Lebanon to open its doors in order for a fire to devour its trees and once again associating the events that are described in this chapter with several trees and linking it back to the almond tree that we saw in Zechariah 1. What is great to notice is that the almond tree is not mentioned as part of the trees that are consumed by this fire. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled, a voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Thus saith the Lord my God, Feed the flock of the slaughter, whose possessors slay them, and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, but lo, I will deliver the men every one into his neighbor's hand, and into the hand of his king, and they shall smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. 
And I took unto me two staves, the one I called Beauty, and the other I called Bands, and I fed the flock. In this section we see the mentioning of howling shepherds and a flock prepared for the slaughter in verse 47. There is also the mention of two staves with the names Beauty and Bands. This, in my opinion, points to Israel entering into Jacob's trouble under the rulership of the ten hybrid kings, or shepherds, that will receive power for an hour with the Antichrist to rule over the world, as described in Daniel 7 and Revelation 17. The reason for the association with Daniel 7 and Revelation 17 comes from Zechariah 11 verse 8 which tells us that three of these will die in one month, or will be cut off in one month, and that they hate the Lord, and that the Lord hates them as well. And this clearly associates them with the ten horns that Daniel saw, of which three were uprooted and replaced by the little horn that represents the Antichrist. Let us see what is written about them in the following passages. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. In the next section we see an explanation about the two staves that were mentioned in verse 7, having the names of beauty and bands. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. The two staves represent two covenants, which God says He will break at this point. The first, which is called beauty, is said to represent God's covenant that He made with all people. In my opinion, this can only represent God's covenant of grace with those who would accept God's gift of salvation through faith, which is given freely to anyone, whether they be Jew or Gentile, before this point in time, and it is acquired through faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God alone. This opportunity is only presented to people during the church age. After this point, the situation changes dramatically. When the staff called beauty is cut in pieces, according to my understanding of the Word of God, people alive on earth will no longer have the option of entering God's kingdom through faith alone but will be required to refuse the mark of the beast and to suffer beheading for their refusal of the mark in order to be granted entry into the kingdom of God. When the staff called beauty is cut in pieces, it would also seem that no Christian that remains on earth will have any of the authority over Satan and his kingdom that the church enjoyed during their time on earth, as this authority will be given over to Satan and he will be able to do as he pleases with those who represent the gleanings of God's harvest, which are intended to be given to Satan according to the harvest pattern found in the word. Verse 11 also describes the poor of the flock that were watching for the Lord's return, recognizing this passage as the word of God to them. The poor of the flock, in my opinion, represents the watching Gentiles, who were not chosen by God, but became the bride after His chosen people rejected Him. Those who remain behind will realize too late that they were not watching and found ready for the arrival of the bridegroom, and expected His return at a later point. We see even Solomon describing the situation in Ecclesiastes 12, also associating the almond tree with this event. 
also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and a desire shall fail. Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Zechariah 11 continues to describe the situation after this point as so terrible that people will become cannibals, eating the flesh of one another. Then said I, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. Zechariah 11 finally ends with a clear description of the Antichrist, his attributes and treatment of Israel, as well as a physical description of his physique, all associated with Lebanon's destruction, mentioned to us in verse 1. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock! The sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. In Zechariah 1 and 11 and Isaiah 17, and also other chapters of the Word of God, we have prophecies pointing to events that are currently developing in the Middle East. These prophecies are clearly pointing to the start of Jacob's trouble. It tells us about God's harvest as well as the rapture of his church. There is also a clear link between these events and times and the seals that are opened in the book of Revelation. What is even more profound is the fact that there are signs and dates associated with these prophecies which could very well point to the days and weeks before us. The month of Shavat is the month in which the almond tree blooms, and according to Zechariah it is also the month in which the vision of war that will remove peace from the earth is given. For me it is very important to keep a close eye on what is currently happening in the Middle East, as the situation there would seem to incorporate more and more prophecies in the Word of God that describe events that are expected to occur when the current dispensation ends. It is possible that nothing may happen in the days before us, and that we may even have to wait until next year this time when the almond tree blossoms again, as we have another lunar eclipse on Tuba Shavat next year, but are you ready for what could happen if our time runs out in this month of Shavat? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God who came to take the sins of the world away and believed in your heart that the Father raised him from the dead? Have you put all your trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins or do you rely in part on what you are doing for God to earn our Heavenly Father's respect? Do you know that Jesus did everything we require to become a child of God and that there is nothing that we can add to what he did for us on the cross? If someone asks you whether you are saved or not, is your response maybe, I hope I have done enough? Do you know that an answer like this shows an incorrect focus? We can only be saved through what Jesus did and not by anything that we do. We can only be saved through faith alone in Jesus alone. So many people I encounter believe that the church will have to be purified during the tribulation by proving its worth to the Lord in the fire of hardship. This is heresy as Jesus already purified the church through his blood. If we claim that more purification is needed for the church to become acceptable to the Lord, then we believe Jesus' work on the cross was incomplete as well as insufficient. Ephesians 5 tells us that Jesus washes us with water, not with fire, and presents the church to himself without spot or wrinkle. The only part that we play in this process is putting all our trust in Jesus. The word clearly shows us that those who remain behind on earth after the rapture will mourn, weep and wail, and authority over the earth will be given back to Satan during this time. Do you really want to be here when this happens, when our Heavenly Father extended a loving invitation to you to attend the wedding of the Bridegroom, 
and us being arrayed in robes of Jesus' righteousness, and not our own, and to dwell in the place that He spent two thousand years to prepare for us. Where would you rather be when God's judgment over the earth starts, attending a heavenly wedding in a new glorified body, or getting in line to be killed here on earth? I hope you will make the right choice in the short time that remains. Please check the links in the description below to read some of the articles that are associated with the passages discussed today. And please join the Signs and Seasons group on Facebook if you have not done so already for access to more updates as we move deeper into these amazing times that we live in. I believe Isaiah 17, speaking of the destruction of Damascus, gives us the final piece of the puzzle to watch for in order to know that our departure is at hand. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. The word also tells us that this day will come like a snare on all of the world, meaning unexpectedly. But our Heavenly Father has given us many signs for us to know that this day is getting closer by what we see happening in the world. Those events are rapidly coming into focus. Be ready for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He will soon be coming for us. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.